And for more details on the impact of the latest developments earlier, we spoke to Peter Biar Ajak. He's the chairperson of the South Sudan Young Leaders Forum. This agreement has, what it proposes essentially is a very bloated government, a government of uh, four vice presidents, 45 cabinet ministers, 550 MPs. This is essentially expanding uh, the, the South Sudanese uh, government enormously, and it will have serious budget implications. Uh, and as we know so far, South Sudan government has been going for a month without paying even the military and the diplomatic services. Now they are saying that they will increase the government by this large number of ministries and MPs. Uh, this will add a huge weight uh, to the economy. I think what everybody needs to understand in uh, this discussion of South Sudan conflict is not just about reaching any agreement or any kind of agreement whatsoever. It's about a, a actually understanding what the conflict is about and then think about how that conflict can be addressed uh, by looking at different pillars that can then make an agreement. But just proposing any kind of agreement for the sake of an agreement so that people appear that the conflict has been ended and people move on because some easy solution has been found. Uh, this is quite dangerous because what IGAD has been doing so far is reducing the entire conflict uh, and, and the war to positions. Who will take what position, who, who will take what uh, uh, percentage of the cabinet and of the parliament, the same thing to the military. And this is very dangerous because what it is doing is perpetuating and rewarding violence. Uh, those who take up arms then go to the bush and demand to be included in the government. And this is a position that South Sudan has been in since 2005. Various groups and militias have always been holding the government at hostage. And the only way that the government has responded and dealt with them had been to inter integrate them into the military and into the government. Sanctions alone are not enough. They are very lazy tools of, of dealing with these kind of people. There are more immediate things that can be done. We have talked about like arm, uh, I mean, of uh, arm embargo. Uh, there is no reason why South Sudan should continue to be receiving arms when we are using those arms to kill our own people. We are not using them to protect our borders. Second, uh, you need to target them better uh, when it comes to uh, traveling. Uh, for the last few months, Riek Machar was placed under house arrest in South Africa, it worked quite well. You couldn't move. Uh, the same sort of things could be used against Salva Kiir and some of the leaders that are close to him. Because they, those same people are the one, uh, if you don't get them out there, there is no way South Sudan is going to move forward. And also, you need to target their families. Uh, they, they're living here in neighbor, in neighborhood. They have a lot of assets. Uh, there's a lot of financial flows that is going on. Uh, but it's really not necessarily targeting them in a negative way. You can also incentivize them. They have all this wealth in Kenya and in Uganda and in Ethiopia. And you can tell them they can keep this wealth only if they allow South Sudan to move forward. I think on a day like this where we reflect on our journey to independence, uh, the, the clear lesson is uh, getting a country, raising the flag, having a currency, uh, coat of arms, and all the other symbols of a nation state is not enough. Uh, it's not really what is, what is it all worth for. All the struggle, all the sacrifice we made was not necessarily to get those symbols. It was so that we have the liberty to be able to determine our future. And what we have not done as people of South Sudan is agree on ideals of state. We have not been able to build consensus, uh, ideas around which we can build a shared future. And what is needed is for us to do that.